Good afternoon, everyone. If you're on the uh, East Coast, uh, good morning if you're on the West Coast. Good evening if you're in Europe, and I hope you're not freezing your butts off if you're in the Midwest. Um, I want to thank uh, the Society. I want to thank Jeffrey, especially for the very thoughtful um, organization of this conference. That was a terrific um, last presentation about the basis of um, consciousness in, in invertebrates, vertebrates, and um, we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes talking about um, higher level order of, of creatures, um, animals, so it's a perfect segue. Um, we human beings, of course, are animals, but there are a lot of other creatures that it turns out um, have many similar capacities to us, but at the same time, they're distinctly different. So we're going to explore some fundamental similarities uh, and then some uh, rather impressive differences. And then I'll wrap up by returning to the main theme, which is the meaning of the sentience that we all share. So let's start with the simple observation that mammals dream. Uh, judging by the twitches and eye movements we can observe in our own cats and dogs, for starters. Even birds and fish appear to dream, and so do invertebrates, uh, specifically octopuses and cuttlefish have been studied. Uh, the latest candidate, which you may have heard about in the last couple of months, is jumping spiders. Um, here is an especially charming specimen in the photo, um, and there's a recent book called When Animals Dream by David Peña Guzman. And he argues that dreaming means that a creature is sentient, that it's an individual experiencing life through sensation. Such a creature may even be self-aware. We can't know for sure, obviously, because they can't tell us, but the evidence is growing. Now, uh, the root of sentience means simply to feel. And the next step is emotion, which I'm going to define as the, the capacity to feel plus the expression of that feeling. Um, neuroscientists and philosophers define emotion a lot of ways, but this is gonna be my working definition. The capacity to feel plus the expression of that feeling. It's what we mean when we say he or she emotes. Emotion is evidenced by animals all around us. Uh, think of pretty much any animal that you've ever encountered at home, on a farm, in a zoo, or that you may have seen in a wildlife documentary. They all show the basic emotions, happiness, sadness, pleasure, fear, anger. And their emotions go further. Humpback whales and orcas, for example, demonstrate affection and loneliness, even gratitude. We'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, elephants give every appearance of joy and sorrow. They seem to mourn their dead, and they unfortunately experience something perilously close to post-traumatic stress disorder. We'll talk a little bit more about elephants also. Baboons can become depressed. Monkeys, angry. Pigs, terrified and parrots cranky. Uh, this is all in the literature, scientific as well as popular. Octopuses and crows seem clearly to have preferences for certain people. Fishes seek out caresses to relieve stress. And rats seem to enjoy being tickled. And why wouldn't they? Uh, they emit ultrasonic chirps. They're like laughs. They follow the experimenter's hands and they playfully nip at them. The lead researcher said, and this was Jak Panksepp, who many of you will, will know of, he said, every possible measure of whether the rats like it shows, yes, they love it. Uh, another thing about rats, uh, they're considered ugly and disgusting, but in experiments, a rat will consistently come to the aid of a fellow rat in distress even when it means having to share a treasured piece of chocolate. 
So they show compassion and some degree of selflessness. Not all humans do. And speaking as someone who prizes chocolate myself, mm, it would depend. As Darwin said, differences between species are a matter of degree, not kind. So it's fair to conclude that numerous species feel their way through life. Now, the poster children, you might say, for animal emotions are undoubtedly elephants, orcas, and dolphins. Consider the way that African elephants belonging to the same group greet one another after a separation. They rush together, flapping their ears and spinning in circles, emitting a loud chorus of rumbles and roars. One experienced observer is convinced, quote, she says, elephants feel a deep sense of joy at being united with friends, reunited with friends. Their vocalizations express something like, wow, it's simply fantastic to be with you again. Elephants can also become agitated at the death of one of their own, and they behave in a way that indicates grief. One well-documented case is that of a matriarch named Eleanor. Weakened by age, Eleanor kept collapsing, and a fellow matriarch, Grace, kept trying to lift her onto her feet. Grace appeared distraught, her facial glands streaming. She stayed with Eleanor as night fell, and overnight, Eleanor died. Over the next several days, Eleanor's family members and her closest friend, Maya, spent time with her body, nudging it and smelling it with their trunks. There are even cases of elephants acting disconsolate when they come across the body of another species. One young orphaned elephant shrieked and moaned when it discovered the buried remains of its companion, a rhinoceros that poachers had killed. The stories that marine biologists tell about orcas and dolphins are equally striking. One orphaned orca named Luna showed up in British Columbia's Nootka Sound, miles from where he'd been born. He immediately began interacting with the local boaters and fishermen. For example, uh, Luna would stay alongside a, doped, a docked boat for hours as the people on it were busy delivering supplies and equipment. When the boat, uh, or sorry, when the people left, he would leave too. But if one person remained aboard sleeping, Luna would often stay with that boat all night. Once, Luna played a bit too energetically with the boat's outboard engine. And the skipper said, hey, Luna, could you leave that alone for a while? And Luna immediately backed away. A sense washed over me, said the skipper, that this orca was just as aware of living as I was, that he could perceive all the details that I could perceive the feeling of atmosphere and sea, the texture of emotions, this was overwhelming. On an equally poignant note, female bottlenose dolphins have been observed carrying their dead calves, presumably their own babies on their back for days or even weeks. Uh, this was actually in the news, I think about two or three months ago. Uh, observers infer that it's an expression of maternal grief and it is heart-wrenching to watch. You can go onto YouTube and people have filmed these things. On one occasion, uh, the mom was accompanied by four other dolphins, perhaps family members who were swimming Shiva, you might say. And I don't actually mean that as a joke. There are important lessons to be drawn here. Number one, Animals are individuals with personalities. They have biographies, not merely biologies. In the words of my friend, Jonathan Balcombe, who has written several excellent books about animal traits, including emotion. Number two, they may even be more aware of feelings than we are. They may feel them more intensely or experience different shades of feeling than we do. I call this living closer to the bone. Other creatures might have stronger, more immediate feelings because unlike us, they don't 
ruminate and analyze. Even if they can't tell us what they're experiencing, I believe we'd be foolish to rule it out. Other animals may even have perceptions we would recognize as spiritual. Talk more about that in a bit. First though, let's turn to the ways that other creatures' capacities clearly exceed our own. They are many and varied, and they're explained in a marvelous new book, An Immense World, by science journalist Ed Young. You'll see here uh, a bunch of examples, starting with what we know quite well, that our dogs live by smell. They may effectively see the images of other dogs as they sniff out their odor. But they're not the only ones who are sentient in, in ways we aren't. The birds and the bees see ultraviolet colors that we can't. When you consider that many birds have eyes on the sides of their head, and when you realize how acute their vision is and how they're attuned to ultraviolet light, well, their visual experience of the world must be something like surround sound would be for us, Dolby sound, but with far more high notes with the ultraviolet. Here are some other amazing capacities of other animals. A rattlesnake is extremely sensitive to body heat. Many migrating creatures rely on the Earth's magnetic field to guide them thousands of miles. A seal can find fish by traces it picks up with its whiskers in the open ocean. If we could only hear, Plants thrum with the song of courting bugs. Bats echolocate in the night, realizing precisely what kind of prey is out there uh, by its unseen shape and movement. Dolphins also use sonar and they can literally see right through you. Perhaps most fantastic of all, whales and elephants can communicate over many miles through infrasound which occurs at a lower wavelength than humans can hear. A few other species have this capacity also. Hippos, giraffes, rhinos, and alligators all can detect uh, infrasound. But there are other sensory abilities that so far at least defy explanation. One is the uh, long observed tendency over centuries, millennia, uh, of, of, of many species to show distress minutes or hours before a natural disaster. One notable example uh, comes from the tsunami that devastated East Asia in 2004. Many people who survived told of birds suddenly taking flight, elephants trumpeting and fleeing to higher ground, and dolphins moving out to sea. If only humans had this ability, because approximately 200,000 people were killed in that disaster. Speaking of elephants, a very strange incident occurred in South Africa in 2012. 20 elephants who had been rescued years, by four, uh, years before by the conservationist Lawrence, Lawrence Anthony showed up at his house the same night he died and they lingered there for two days. Well, they had not visited there for a year and a half. Were they paying their respects? Call it coincidence if you like. In his book, Beyond Words, naturalist Carl Safina recounts an incident at sea. A group of dolphins, well known to the marine biologists who were studying them, acted unusually. Instead of coming near the boat and frolicking, they flanked it at a distance. About the same time, someone discovered that a crew member on board had died. Again, this could be a coincidence, but it could also be a kind of feeling we don't yet understand. I also want to mention a fairly common trait that simple biology can't explain. Many animals demonstrate compassion, uh, not just for their own species, but for other species as well. We've all heard accounts of human swimmers being saved by dolphins or whales, or being protected by them against sharks. Why should they do it? Many other species are on this honor roll of saving people, including a Vietnamese pot-bellied pig, a South African parrot, 
and a Western lowland gorilla named Binti Jua. Uh, that last case happened in 1996 at the Brooklyn, uh, I'm sorry, the Brookfield Zoo outside of Chicago. Binti Jua saved the life of a three-year-old boy who had fallen 24 feet down into the gorilla enclosure. She cradled his unconscious body and she protected him from male gorillas that tried to get close. Then carrying him along with her own infant, she gently handed him over to zookeepers at the habitat door. Thanks to the web, you can see many such accounts on YouTube. Seals rescuing dogs, apes saving birds, you name it. What we witness is not just empathy, but sympathy, acting on the plight of another, not just feeling it, but acting on it, demonstrating it. When it's done to save a member of another species, that feeling must be strong indeed. So there are several lessons learned here. First, as Ed Yong points out, no creature is perceiving the all-encompassing complete reality. Each of us, regardless of species, operates within our own sensory bubble. He calls this perceptual world the Umwelt, a German word that was coined a hundred years ago. Regardless of whether we're a rabbit, a flounder, or a human, this is what we take for granted. It's all we know the world to be. But in fact, the world is much more. Human beings' primary sense is sight. So unless we're blind or vision impaired, we're biased that way. We say seeing is believing. You're all watching your screens. I'm looking at you through my screen. Very much oriented towards vision. Um, when we falter, we apologize for the oversight. If we get something, we say, ah, I see. We have a vision of the future and so on. But we don't detect infrasound. We can't see ultraviolet colors, nor can we detect the Earth's magnetic field. In fact, most of the uh, uh, spectrum uh, we, we don't take in. We just take in a certain portion that's visible to us and to our species. So we need to be uh, more humble. Uh, to get past the unwritten rule that humans are the be-all and end-all of evolution. We're, we're like other animals in some ways, but unlike them in others. We have tremendous intelligence, but we also have folly, hubris, and stupidity to match. Part of our short-sightedness is plainly our suspicion and hostility toward the other, whoever and what other, uh, whatever that other might be. It could be the other driver, it could be the other team, the other ethnicity, the other creature. Often it's what we don't understand. But we're at a crossroads now. Wild animals and their habitats are fast disappearing. Humans and the animals we raise to eat make up 96% of the biomass on the planet. All the other mammals, Birds, reptiles, and amphibians make up just 4%. Under the water, fish populations are about half what they were 50 years ago, and insects show a comparable decline. So it is time, past time, to reconsider a lot of assumptions and to open our mind to possibilities that just a few years ago would have seemed far-fetched. What I wanna propose is that feelings are the basis of what we call soul, especially deep feelings, those that move us the most based on our connection with others. Because emotions always relate to our sense of ourselves in relationship with others. So we're moved to express sorrow, elation, loneliness, love, even jealousy, shame, indignation, fury. We're moved to express devotion to others or on the opposite end, disdain. We have fun together, we mourn, we express gratitude, we try to help, we try to rescue. 
it boils down to what you might call fellow feeling. The degree to which any individual of any species displays fellow feeling is, I propose, their degree of soulfulness. Uh, there are two books that have helped to shape my approach here, among many, um, but I want to display these two. Uh, Mama's Last Hug by Franz Duval. Um, he's a primatologist at Emory University. Uh, and Cy Montgomery, who is a superb writer and naturalist. And I've been in contact with them. I've, I've corresponded with uh, all the authors mentioned in this presentation, with the exception of Ed Young, but I'm going to be reaching out to him hopefully soon. It's notable that the connection between feelings and soul is found in our very language. A soulless person or corporation displays an utter lack of empathy. Right, so an, an athlete who inspires their fellow players is the team's heart and soul. And we confide to somebody we're especially passionate about that we want them body and soul. Clearly this is not soul in a religious context as in an immortal soul that we possess. Um, I mean it uh, biologically and emotionally. In, in our lives here and now. It's not a thing, an entity so much as connectedness is what I'm talking about with feelings uh, and the way they uh, help us relate to others. And I'll add uh, one more thing, which is that a soulful person inevitably has a strong feeling for nature. Why? Because nature is what spawned us, every being, every single thing that's alive. A person who has no regard for nature, no feeling of connection with that source, no sense of awe or wonder, is somebody dangerous. I'd like to wind down with uh, three anecdotes that always make me smile, hopefully you as well. The first is uh, what Jane Goodall experienced when she was a young primatologist. Uh, one particular day in the Gombe forest, and I'll quote from her remembrance, lost in awe at the beauty around me, she says, I must have slipped into a state of heightened awareness. It seemed to me that self was utterly absent. I and the chimpanzees, the earth and the trees and air seemed to merge, to become one with the spirit power of life itself. The air was filled with a feathered symphony, the even song of birds. I heard new frequencies in their music and also in the singing insects' voices, notes so high and sweet I was amazed. Never had I been so intensely aware of the shape, the color of individual leaves, the varied patterns of the veins that made each one unique. Scents were clear as well, easily identifiable. The aromatic scent, of young crushed leaves was almost overpowering. Goodall's perception of the unity of everything in nature is something I wonder if other animals share from time to time, if they do indeed live their lives closer to the bone, perhaps uh, this type of uh, unifying experience, transcendent experiences is not uncommon for them. We don't know. The second account is from a naturalist named Adrian Cortland. He once observed a wild chimp in the Congo, quote, gaze at an especially beautiful sunset for a full 15 minutes, watching the changing colors and forsaking his customary evening meal in the process, unquote. Was this chimp lost in reverie? Goodall, for one, is convinced that chimps can be spiritual. The last story is from another book by Franz Duval. Uh, he writes, on a cold December Sunday, maybe like this one, uh, a female humpback whale was spotted off the California coast, entangled in the nylon ropes used by crab fishermen. She was about 50 feet long. The rescue team was dispirited by the sheer amount of ropes, about 20 of them, some around the tail, one in the whale's mouth. The ropes were digging into the blubber, leaving cuts. The only way to free the whale was to dive under the surface to cut away the ropes. 
divers spent about one hour doing so. It was a Herculean job, obviously not without risk, given the power of a whale's tail. The most remarkable part came when the whale realized it was free. Instead of leaving the scene, she hung around. The huge animal swam in a large circle, carefully approaching every diver separately. She nuzzled one, then moved on to the next until she had touched them all. One of them said, it felt to me like it was thanking us, knowing that it was free and that we had helped it. I never felt threatened. That is soul. Uh, we have about five minutes, I think, left for questions, so I'd like to open it up uh, and thank all of you for your attention. Uh, and there's my website address if you'd like to learn more or to be in contact with this human animal. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation, Michael. Any questions? You can either type them in chat or, oh, we have one from Roulette. This time we're going to get you in first, Roulette, so that you don't get shut out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let me preface my remark by saying I'm interested in the evolution of common sense. Um, if we think about humans right now, we are beginning to be concerned about climate change and whatnot. Is there any evidence or can you cite any examples of writers um, who are speaking to the issue of animals that might be anticipating uh, evolutionary changes, extinction, for example? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can give you um, one example uh, is, uh, is Ed Yon, I mentioned. Um, the tag I, I, is I know his work, yes. deals with climate change. I don't know in the context in which you mean. Well, the reason common sense is uh, just as humans communicate with each other, that's what common sense is about. It's about herd behavior. Um, one would wonder if there's any evidence of elephants or other animals um, communicating with others about changing Sharing the peril? Right, impairing, impending peril. That's a very interesting question. Um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if folks have started to study this. I would say also just editorially that uh, maybe a lack of, of common sense among humans has, has brought us to this point, but that's another use of that term. But I understand what you mean. It's a very interesting question. I, I, I really don't know. Okay, Terry. Hi, uh, wonderful talk. Thank you, Michael. So what books would you recommend regarding animal psychic abilities to uh, connect with humans and other animals and even connect when humans are dreaming to enter their dreams? Well, um, the first book that comes to mind is one that, that uh, I had published a couple of years ago called Sensitive Soul. Um, and there are two chapters in there on um, animal capacities, um, some of which I, I hinted at in this, in this presentation, there are others. Um, and I'm trying to remember uh, sources that I drew on uh, for, for, for those chapters. Uh, they're not coming to mind easily right now, but um, if you uh, email me, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, what is my email address? It's, it's author at michaeljower.com. <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, I can hopefully recollect and, and give you some suggestions. I, okay, because I just want to share one quick story where uh, one of my dogs came in my dream time and showed me a cave where other dog Bichons were living and being raised. And that was a very startling dream because I never even thought that that could happen. Yeah, animals have a tremendous, you know, tremendous power of, of animal images, uh, which go, go back eons. Our, our images of, of animals are, are archaic. Um, Jung talked about it a lot, uh, dream imagery of different animals. And that's something else that I've written about. And again, I'll, I'll think over some of the sources that I've looked at. James Hillman, 
I guess is is uh, the main author that I can recommend. He he's written a lot. Unfortunately, no, no longer with us, but uh, wrote a lot, uh, very powerful about um, animal imagery and um, how it connects us at a at an archetypical level. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Michael. It was a fantastic presentation. You're getting flooded with comments about how much people enjoyed your presentation. I think you're so far the leader in the popular presentation category. So congratulations there. I didn't know it was a contest, uh, but I'm glad. <laughs> Very gratifying. <laughs> it's always nice, isn't it? Okay, thanks.